the title of the talk is hardware implementation of neural network algorithms based on machine learning and neuroscience models using spintronics so a lot of buzzwords right so there's we have neural network we have machine learning neuroscience spintronics lots of buzzwords in the same thing so uh, so this so you can as you can understand so this is highly interdisciplinary in nature whatever we are doing now so it involves spintronics is like physics of spin of electrons and how you can manipulate magnetic moments with it and do electronics low power electronics at nanoscale level so is material science and electromagnetism together is a spintronics thing then on we are trying to connect it with machine learning and computational neuroscience and in order to do so spintronics alone is not good enough you need traditional analog electronics as well so overall together it's like brain inspired cognitive intelligence systems to be built using spintronics and transistors so first and overall uh, i'll quickly review my doctoral research a bit so essentially we are trying to use spintronics in my doctoral research at different parts of our traditional computing architecture where a traditional computing architecture will have your processor separate from your memory the processor will be the fastest thing the the computing element in the computer and you have multiple levels of me memory like the cache memory which is on the processor very fast then the slower one main memory and then you have the non volatile storage thing so spintronics is already being used for the last two decades in magnetic hard disk now we worked on how to use spintronics in memory as well as processor so first i will present in one slide my one of my key publications from uh, uh, phd it was using nano magnets which are dipole coupled passing current through them chaining them like a bunch of inverters and clocking them experimentally using uh, spintronics a phenomena called spin orbit torque at this nano interfaces remember these things are like 10 nanometer 5 nanometer 1 nanometer thickness we are talking about so this work got published in nature nanotechnology there is one issue for which processors though this is a good that is a nature paper and all but the problem with the fact of using magnus for processor is that magnus though are low energy consuming they are fairly slow like magnus take a much longer time to switch than a transistor is a picosecond versus femtosecond kind of thing as a result magnus probably will never be very useful for processors and there is another thing that intel has intel and other companies have developed the transistor technology for the last 50 years so unless there is a major motivation why will they ever change it to a magnetic system or some other new kind of system right another place where magnus can be much more useful potentially would be memory because memories need the current memories which we use for main memory and cache mem uh, for the cache memory are volatile it will be much better if those memories are non volatile and magnus offer you the non volatility and they are fairly compact and you can make really small tiny magnetic systems so we showed a specific deterministic kind of switching using uh, this spin orbit torque phenomena in my phd again experiment simulation both i'm not going to details of it because that's not the main thing about my talk so this got published in proceedings of national academy of sciences the third thing i did in my phd was a mode of a physics physics kind of research where essentially we had domain walls in this kind of ferromagnetic systems one nanometer thick 10 nanometer thick tantalum we passed current we got spin orbit torque with which we moved the domain wall we measured measured experimentally using curd effect and then we did simulations micromagnetic simulations to match it that got out in scientific reports now the current theme of my research is if we can use the fact that we can move domain walls in this magnetic systems means we can create states with multiple levels of magnetization like a domain wall in the center would mean half magnets are up half magnets are down domain wall closer to this edge would be very few magnets are down most of them are up so you are changing your magnetic configuration by moving the domain wall and based on tunneling magneto resistance the resistance is also going to change so you essentially get multiple electrically controlled resistive states in the system so it's a functional level is a memory store and it can be useful for new kinds of computing so we'll, which we'll talk about it now so essentially my ongoing research is trying to connect these different ideas of magnetism memory logic for this new kind of computing so what is this new kind of computing so this machine learning or more specifically here we'll talk about neural networks so essentially in any machine learning problem at a fundamental level you can think of it as something like this we have been given a bunch of training inputs you have been given a bunch of training outputs and you have to come up with an approximate a function so it can be matter, matching patterns it can be matching records of data prediction 
and there is also another thing about a predictive element to it that though you have to match a you have to map a function you have to put a function to map this to this the given data for any new data which is coming the test data your function should be doing fairly well it should not be that a new data your function is doing very bad so that's important that it has to work well on the test data as well so what so how do you go about it in machine learning what you do you select a model that model has a set of parameters then you have an algorithm with which you train on this data and you gradually fit this you just make this parameters better and better till you are getting a very satisfactory result here now in order to do this you can see that you are essentially tuning parameters which means you will have a memory element in it and on that memory you are saving parameters and those parameters you are working on them and computing on them updating them putting them back again so there's a lot of exchange between memory and computing going on continuously in a machine learning algorithm much more than non machine learning algorithms which means that this kind of magnetic systems can be useful there which have inherent memory in it and can do computing as well they may not be as good to just do computing but a memory computing combination they might be very good for it so in that regard this is a i think a people in this community this is like the first one of the first neural networks people solve so this is a fully connected network with an input layer and there's an output layer no hidden layer present this input layer this multiple bits uh, this inputs correspond to the different pixel intensities of this images and your job is to classify them as like this is a 5 this is a 0 this is a 4 your job is to train the network such that it can do it so essentially you are mapping it from this inputs to this outputs what say if it's a 5 the fifth node will be 1 all others will be negative 1 things like that so a standard computation method is you first do a weighted summation then do a tan sigma function and then once you have the result you compare it with the desired result then you find the correction in weight and you update the weight accordingly using this stochastic gradient rule method now in order to do this if you see that the because we are constantly updating those weights you need a lot of memory computing working hand in hand now in order to make the computation faster is not like is my idea this has been tried out for several years which is this neuromorphic computing thing where you essentially instead of a traditional computer will have a memory computing uh, computing separation as i've showed before there will be a place for memories there will be a place for memories there will be a place for computation so this means you have to continuously exchange data between memory and computing which makes this a slow and energy consuming process on the other hand so ibm came up with this two notch chip other companies and groups also came up with their own neuromorphic computing chips but instead of having one memory one computer they split it into cores they had some memory some computing at each of these cores going on but you can still see that at a single core the memory is still separate the computing is still separate so the neuron the computing is happening here the memory is here the memory and computing are still separate at a single core level because they are using a digital technology where they are storing this memory in the the memory thing is in a dram or an sram kind of thing so if we want to do a purely analog neuromorphic computing we need memory elements right at this kind of crossbar architecture this intersection element so the spintronic devices can be useful here because say we have the kind of domain wide device i showed you before which i worked on in my phd you put one of those devices there as you pass current from this terminals you do a matrix multiplication of this weight times input you get your output then you do this tan sigma through a circuit then after that you can generate the error and then you correct the error by updating the weights how will you update the weights you know if you know that how much i need to update my weight you will also know how much i need to move my domain wall which means you will generate a current from here with which you can just move that one over the last 5 years uh, professor julie grolier's group in europe and professor kaushik roy's group in us they have done a significant amount of work simulation and experiment wise on this kind of spintronic neuromorphic systems and my work is also in those lines so essentially what we have done here in iit delhi in our group is we have simulated this kind of spintronic neural network where the feed forward computation is happening by multiplication essentially you are passing currents here these currents are proportional to your inputs they get multiplied by the conductances and they get passed through this kind of resistive bars the net current passes through some kind of neuron function which i will show and then you have an error generation circuit which generates the error and then knows the amount of weight by which you have to update it and sends the right currents move the domain walls updates the weight you keep doing this and iteratively over and over and over again till you train the network till you can classify these different digits or different patterns or whatever the first thing is the synapse so we, i already showed you that you have a you could have a domain wall system like this if you push current the domain wall moves that leads to different changes in resistances so all these resistances are non volatile and you can electrically controllable making it good for synapse 
we proposed a similar device with communes here. So word we had a bunch of communes. You pass push we push current here. Our simulations show that the communes will move, and if the communes move, the resistance changes, and we again have similar kind of state. Given that we have the synaptic devices, we also need neuron, which is this tan uh, tan sigmoid tan hyperbolic function. For that, we have used the transistor-based circuit. Reason being, spintronics we want to use only where it is absolutely necessary, which is non-volatility. When it comes to neuron circuits, you don't need non-volatility. That is, there is no memory needed for it. Why don't you use transistors, which are much more common and widespread? So we have made analog circuit-based uh, neuron computation here. Now, with that, we get a very nice. We simulate these things on uh, Cadence Virtuoso kind of software, and we get very nice circuit simulation, uh, very nice results over here. Again. We do, we, we come in simulated the whole error generation, error correction, weight update, write current generation circuit using Cadence Virtuoso circuit simulator. And these are the kind of current it generates and sends it back to the synapses to update the weights. So the overall result for that, what we have gotten is we have on an MNIST data set. So this is a very standard neuro uh, data set used in machine learning where whenever you are talking about training a network, train it on, my MNIST, on the MNIST data set. Essentially, it's a bunch of digits handwritten by people, and your job of the computer is to be able to distinguish between what's a 5, what's a 3, what's a 4, things like that. So this kind of data set, we have trained it. We have got an accuracy very high of 97%. Test accuracy is low, 65%. And there's a reason for this. The reason for this is that we, have, we don't have any hidden layer in the system. And if you're from the machine learning background, you will know that in order to get success, you get fairly high accuracy, test accuracy here, then you need at least one hidden layer. So again, the thing that was mentioned right in the beginning about this machine learning algorithm, given the training data, your job is to fit a curve on the training data. And that you can do very well. But your job is also to be able to do well on the data which you haven't seen yet, but which will come to you later. So there it is doing not doing very well because we have a hidden, we don't have a hidden layer. The problem is if you want to incorporate hidden layers in hardware, in software, you can put as many hidden layers you want. In hardware, if you want to implement hidden layers, that error correction uh, circuit which you had you would need the weights of the synaptic devices at the hidden layer, which makes it difficult to implement. So we are still trying to do that in our group. But in addition to that, we have come up with an alternative approach, which is the last part of my talk. So we so far, we were implementing this traditional machine learning kind of algorithms on hardware. And we are finding some difficulty in implementing them. So question is, why not look at some neural network which already exists in hardware in nature? And the best neural network which you have in hardware and which is operating day after day, every day, every second is our human brain. So look at the architecture of the human brain and try to make neural networks like that. So here, you, you might be thinking it's a bit paradoxical that I'm calling a neural network first. And later, I'm saying neural network Let's look at the brain to understand neural networks. The reason is that though the new world neural network came up in literature a long time ago based on inspired by the brain, the way the machine learning community dealt with it, they did not, they followed the brain architecture a little bit, but not much. So off plate with this third generation neural networks, we are trying to get back to how the brain is computing much more. And that's why I'm specifically emphasizing on brain in the last part of the neural network talk that I'm giving. So here you can see that in the, inside the brain you have a, uh, you, ha you have this kind of pre, uh, you have this neuron which is connected to the next layer of neuron by synaptic connections. So if the information is propagating like this, this is not my pre neuron, this is my post neuron connected by synapse. Brain has 10 to the power 11 neurons connected through 10 to the power 15 synapses, and it, that gets working, and that leads to all this human consciousness and all that. So what we have done is we have, we, of course, we have not been able to model 10 to the power 11 neurons. We have modeled somewhat around like 100 neurons or something like that, 1,000 neurons. We are still working at that level. So here we have our neurons are following this kind of leak integrate fire model, which is a capacitive model. Again, based on biological data, what you see, if you, there is a current flowing, the voltage goes up. Once it reaches a threshold, there's a spike, the voltage again goes down. Another key thing in the network is the synapse. So the neuron is not the memory. The memory is the synapse. And in the brain, memory computing are happening together, j just like our desired neuromorphic computer by this, this synaptic connection. So in this synapses, the change in weight, this has been biologically observed in the rat's hippocampus, that if your post neuron, which is the neuron after the synapse, spikes right after the pre-neuron, the change in weight is a lot. Otherwise, the change in weight is less. So it's like a positive feedback mechanism. If my pre-neuron is making my post neuron fire, the synapse in between is getting stronger. 
which means this connection is a strong connection, make it stronger. So that's the long term potentiation thing. The opposite is true if my pre neuron fires after my post neuron, that means the, that correlation is bad, reduce the weight there. So that's my long term depression. Okay, so that's the red part of the curve. So what you have done is we have first simulated through a micromagnetic transistor combination approach a circuit which drives current into a spintronic device and you can get this kind of spike time dependent plasticity SCDP property of synapse in the systems. So this transistor system gives an exponentially decaying current. You can see that this is my pre neuron spike. These are my post neuron spikes. As my post neuron spike is going further away from pre neuron spike, my right current is decaying exponentially and the change in conductance and hence the change in weight is going down exponentially which is the STDP behavior. Now this is the key thing. So using that we know the at biological level how a neuron behaves, how a synapse behaves. Now we are connecting all of them together to form this network in simulation and we with the spintronic implementation and we have and we have trained this network using a supervised algorithm, supervised learning algorithm on different kind of data sets. So the way the supervised learning algorithm here works is like this. Initially when you are training it for the given input you know your output. So suppose I am training it for a digit 0. So I expect this node to spike. What I do is during training I put a large I put a large current inhibitory current on the other neurons so that they don't spike and only this guy spikes. Then for neuron, digit 1 I do the same thing with this neuron and so on. And essentially when I test it then I remove all this inhibitory current. It's like making a person walk. Uh, a person you are first giving them a, a, a crutch or a walker to walk and then once the person gets a balance and understands how it works, take the crutch or walk away, make, make, uh, the other person can walk by himself. So such is the supervised learning scheme. So if you do this on some standard data sets like Fisher Iris which is like a classifying flowers or WBC which is classifying uh, malignant cancer cell from a benign cancer cell, we have a very high like 90% both training and test accuracy. But what happens on the MNIST data set which is the most desired data set which I have shown before, we have got an 91% accuracy in training, great. Test accuracy is still not coming out to be great, it's like 55% we are working on this. A very interesting thing that we see here is that once I train my network on this kind of, on this kind of different digits, the weights of the synapses, if I plot them in matrices, the weights are taking the shape of the digits. The, uh, to summarize, what we have done is we have done simulations of spintronic synaptic devices through micromagnetics. Then you have combined them with transistors to make big systems and you have done on-chip learning for different kind of neural networks. Some of them are less biology based, some of them are more biology based on this kind of data flood classification sets. Future goal is to fabricate this kind of networks in the laboratory. Another future goal is to develop better cognitive models of the brain showing the similar algorithms I showed. So here's our newly formed research group in IIT Delhi and we thank, I would like to thank Indian Academy of Sciences a lot for uh, the associateship and giving the opportunity to present my research.